I guess I was fairly apprehensive the whole time that I was flying in combat. And, and I guess there's good reason to feel that way. I'm there to cause a lot of damage and a lot of harm, and therefore they would like to damage me. And I was 25 years old at that time. The Huey was first developed uh, in 1956, the, the A model, and uh, it was in development for quite a few years and uh, didn't get to Vietnam until uh, uh, the mid-60s, early to mid-60s. The A models went in and then, uh, then the Ds were developed. The A's were uh, a B uh, and a B model was a sh the short body and the D and the H were the long body like uh, our uh, helicopter right here and, and most of the B's were used it turned out for gunships eventually and the D's and H's were for troop transport and medevac. The Huey was the mainstay of the uh, the Army uh, Corps in, uh, in Vietnam and started out with the the A's and the B's and C's and then the D's and H's and and uh, they were used to evacuate uh, the Vietnamese and what was left of the uh, uh, U.S. In, uh, in Vietnam in 1975 when we, when we left. This uh, hey, uh, November 1-4 Sierra Delta, the, uh, the serial number is 12369. Uh, uh, it's actually 6212369. 62 was denoted the uh, year that the contract was let. So it probably uh, was built between 62 and 63. It's actually, so we've been told, the oldest uh, Huey flying today. Uh, there are a number of them in the 70s. They're a little newer and less time on them and so forth. But this one uh, turned out to be a, a survivor and, uh, and it was in, in pretty good shape. It was in Vietnam in 66, 67. And it was kind of rare to uh, bring a Huey back as the people who were alive at that time know they kind of, if they were in an accident or something, they would kind of pile them up in a ball, you know, and, and uh, just use them for parts or whatever. But this one was damaged twice. We don't know whether it was shot down or uh, a blade strike or whatever, but it wasn't damaged so much that it couldn't be uh, brought back and uh, brought into depot maintenance, they call it. So uh, that's probably, they do a lot, did a lot of maintenance in Vietnam, but uh, the depot maintenance, that was the most serious one. They used the, uh, in the Marines, with CH-46 that I flew in Vietnam, we, they sent them to Japan. 
Uh, this was sent to Corpus Christi, Texas, and, and uh, rebuilt, uh, brought into a flying condition, uh, and, uh, and then uh, it uh, served in the United States in reserve and guard units as well as uh, uh, training. I flew T-6s uh, for quite a few years in the Minneapolis area and I was in a, a T-6 Thunder. And we had a safety meeting, uh, I think it was in uh, 2000, 2015, and my partner Barry came up to me and said, Dave, uh, I want to talk to you after the meeting. So I talked to him and said, what up? I want to buy a Huey. Really? And I said, well, if you have any, do you have any uh, flight time? Any no, I'm in flight school right now. but. Uh, 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 I plan on getting my license, and uh, I said, well, I, I know a, a business that uh, restores Hueys, uh, Northwest Helicopters in Olympia, Washington, and I just saw an ad that they had several Hueys for sale. So I went home and got the tray to plane and looked at it and, uh, and talked to the guy, uh, Brian Reynolds, who uh, owns this place, and said, hey, we're kind of interested in Huey, and uh, have you got anything? And so she sent me a bunch of pictures. and. Uh, Barry and I uh, looked over and said, we've got to go to Olympia and look at this Huey, which we did. And we flew a couple of them and uh, talked a bit about the uh, price and this and that, and uh, they were all flyable. We didn't have to do anything maintenance-wise to get them up and running. The, the radio package was pretty weak, so we worked on that through the years. But uh, So anyway, we came back to Wisconsin. We were both from Wisconsin and, uh, and said, you know, uh, I think we need to buy that. So we went back out and uh, I flew it, uh, this guy was gonna give us some flight time and I flew it for uh, six hours. He was gonna give us 10 hours and he's about, we've been terrorizing the neighborhood too much with the auto rotations and everything. So <laughs> I don't think we can do that anymore. So I turned around to uh, uh, Barry and our mechanic Wes Nettle that came along and looked over the paperwork. and said, what do you think guys? And it gave me the thumbs up. So the next morning we flew it from Olympia to uh, New Richmond and then Spooner, Wisconsin. Two days, 1,800 miles, and uh, our uh, time with the Huey began. And it was, uh, it was a beautiful, fun trip, and uh, we've, been, uh, we've been having fun with it and sharing the Huey with veterans and the public and the veterans' uh, spouses and children for the last seven years. Mechanically, it was in good shape, but uh, there's a, it's an ongoing uh, thing, uh, taking care of the maintenance issues and so forth. And uh, we are blessed to have volunteers out of uh, St. Paul and all around the, uh, the Richmond area that have come forth through the years. Our, our uh, crew chief, uh, Bob Drillmeyer, he lives about 10 miles away and he heard the Huey and he came uh, over and chatted with us. And he's been our crew chief ever since. I know he, he wishes he hadn't come over or not, but it's been a lot of work, but he does a great job. And, and uh, Jerry Chapman, uh, another one, he was a Vietnam uh, Huey pilot. Uh, he lived in St. Paul and, and in, the, in the reserve for 25 years, something like that in St. Paul. So he, he was a, in the maintenance department and a test pilot. So uh, he's involved with our uh, continuing to keep the Huey in the in the air, so we, we have a turnaround. It was just Barry, and now we have a real fine crew uh, that uh, works with us and has fun doing it, and so uh, that's what we've been doing. Well, once I, I flew the Huey in uh, Army Flight School. Uh, when, when I got out of OSS in 68, June 68, they were, needed some uh, slots. Uh, uh, Pensacola was backlogged two, three months for the Marines and the Navy. Uh, are trained and uh, so the Marines got some slots in the Army so I went TAD to the Army for 10 months and uh, and got my uh, uh, basic helicopter training and a TH-55 and a, and a Bell 13 and Huey was the last helicopter flew flew at 80 hours and got my Army wings then went back in the Marines and went up to North Carolina to uh, New River we're near Lejeune and uh, transitioned into the CH-46 uh, uh, which is tandem motor Boeing, and uh, in September I went to Vietnam uh, and, and uh, flew CH-46s for a year. Well, the Huey was a, a utility helicopter, the UH-1, the U stands for utility, uh, I believe, and 
it had a multitude of uh, missions in Vietnam in the Army. Uh, dust off was the, the medevac uh, portion of it. We're basically a little bit different than the Marines. Uh, if you were a dust off pilot, uh, which I believe uh, General Brady uh, was, uh, as well as other things, uh, you uh, pretty much, all, that's all you did is do medevac. And that was one of the more hazardous duties because when somebody needed a medevac, well, it was a, a snake bite or something like that, or was it they just got a uh, you know, firefight or whatever and got wounded. So that was a pretty uh, risky job. We also used for troop inserts and extracts. Uh, you see these movies, that are about a dozen Hueys coming into an open field and so forth and drop it off 100 troops or so and, uh, and an assault. So that was a, a, a use that they used it for. And, uh, and then uh, C and C command and control, flying generals around and, and flying uh, you know, members of the military around. They had to go from point A to point B. There, there weren't very many roads around. The ones that were there weren't very safe. Uh, they had a lot of bombs on them and uh, IUDs and so forth. So uh, it was pretty much the, uh, the way you got around in Vietnam. Uh, so it was uh, I Corps was where I was, first Corps up by the DMZ. Uh, the Army was up there a little bit, but the, pretty much the Marines that had come in in 75 stayed up there. And then the, uh, they had the H-34, which uh, is at this uh, presentation uh, to begin with. And then the CH-46 took uh, the role from the 34, which a basic role, utility helicopter, had a lot more uh, capacity to lift and uh, like 20 or so U.S. troops. And, uh, and there were a lot of mountains in the north and had a lot more power than the Huey. He was a little underpowered, especially in the, the A's and B models. Uh, they, they just didn't do well in the mountains, so they stayed down the lowlands of uh, first, second, or, uh, second, third, fourth corps. Well, it's, uh, it's part of the history, I guess, of the United States and specifically of uh, Vietnam War. If anybody was alive then and watching the news, I mean, they had Hueys uh, uh, in almost every night that they were crashing, and which uh, I, I, I think the uh, fake, fake news started in the 60s. When I got to flight school and, uh, for, and my first instructor was a veteran uh, helicopter pilot, was in Vietnam. And I said, I'm glad to see you, because I didn't know if there were any uh, veteran uh, Huey helicopter pilots around there. And I hugged him. Uh, but uh, anyway, it was, it's just been uh, gratifying and just uh, honored to be able to, to fly this and still have my health to do it uh, and, uh, and come here and uh, share it with, here, with uh, the EAA folks. Uh, and it really gets crowds. I mean, there's a trench around this thing. And they, and we stay right with it all the time. We don't just bring it in and drop it off. We, we stay there and it gets kind of warm and we get kind of tired doing it, but uh, it's worth it and we have a good time doing it. Yeah. The Huey was a, a, a great machine. Uh, initially, like most aircraft, tele, uh, we had a lot of mechanical issues, I'm sure, with it and so forth. But uh, in the first five, ten years, they were pretty well worked on, very dependable aircraft. And if uh, you had some mechanical problems, shot down or whatever, you could get it down uh, a lot easier than in some helicopters. It had a tremendous uh, inertia, uh, inertia in the blades on the thing. So you could auto-rotate, you know, find a spot that might be out in front of you a, a little bit rather than having to go take what you had right below you. So it was a uh, very, forgiving in that regard and very dependable and uh, didn't break down much. It lost engines and things like all of them, but uh, it has a reputation, I think, for those who try it. It's a wonderful aircraft. Slow, a little bit slow, 85 knots, uh, kind of is what we fly this one at. It has a red line of 123 knots, but it doesn't really like that. <laughs> it gets really choppy or whatever, but uh, so anyway. And it doesn't have a big range, but it didn't need it for the mission that it was designed for. It's got about two and a half hours of fuel, and after about two hours, you better be looking for, for fuel. And it, and it burns, uh, burns a bit of it, about 80 gallons an hour, which uh, uh, is kind of thirsty. <laughs> Thank you.
the last uh, uh, helicopter out of Vietnam, and the first one was a Marine helicopter. Uh, it was a 34s went in, and uh, the CH-46 came off the top of the embassy because the Huey just couldn't uh, didn't have enough power or whatever to uh, to go. So the Marines had that role off from ships, but the uh, the Hueys did come in while they could and land below the embassy. So it was kind of both Army and Marines uh, uh, participated in that. You know. Dave, how can you afford to fly this darn thing around? And uh, well, we do get some appearance fee uh, uh, money from time to time, uh, uh, but uh, basically, uh, Barry was not in the war. He was younger than me, about 10 years younger, but, and he was in high school and college. But uh, he, he has, he feels lot strong feelings about the Vietnam War and the people who were in it. He had a uh, cousin that was uh, two years as a special forces or whatever, and came out with pretty, a lot of, issues and so forth so we basically uh, sharing the Huey uh, life has been good to us uh, we had a few extra dollars I always say I'm I'm uh, spending my ungrateful children and grandchildren's inheritance um, but actually they're pretty nice guys but uh, yeah. but uh, you know it, it is a little expensive but uh, we enjoy sharing it especially veterans uh, veterans come up to the helicopter and uh, every once in a while one of them can't can't uh, get near it, he just can turns around and walks away. It was a bad uh, experience they had with it. Others, the majority already, they come up, some kiss the Huey, because it uh, took them out of a uh, firefight that they were wounded, or uh, resupplied them when they were out of ammo, and out of water, and out of food, and, and mostly it really served as a uh, great uh, tool. When they heard, heard a Huey coming, ah, it's for us, you know, either taking us out or or giving us supplies, so so that's fun to see these guys and talk to them, and and a lot of them don't share their experiences, but when they get near this and talk to me and and, and the crew, they open up and uh, we just let them let them talk and vent, and so that's fun to see, and and their children uh, that the the uh, doctor might be dead, but their children have heard about if their their uh, dad was a gunner on a Huey or a pilot or. A, crew chief or just was rescued or something by the Huey, so that, that's been very rewarding for us. Most of the Hueys had M60s. This is a replica here, uh, but this is where the uh, the gun, uh, the crew chief, you man the gun, and the other side is used uh, generally the uh, gunner. Uh, and when they first started out, they had a bungee cord down here, and uh, the the M60 hung from it, and it was very very good, very versatile. They could get around here, except that they started shooting out the blades uh, and. And the tail rotor here and there, they got the, you turn the aircraft would turn into the run something. And <laughs> so they put they designed this in the late uh, mid early 70s. That gun mount that's got stops on it, so it can't it can't shoot out the tail rotor or the blades yeah. or the pilot. They got a couple of pilots too. Uh, the the cockpit. These are the uh, original original. Uh, But uh, is protection from uh, small arms fire, a 30 caliber or whatever, it would stop that. A 50 would melt right through it. But that's an armored seat. Getting a little, having a hard time finding this stuff here. Uh, and we also wore a go, chicken plate. It was, it was uh, real thick, it weighed about 25 pounds. And uh, not everybody wore them or whatever, but that protected you from the front. Because you're pretty vulnerable in front. Of course, if you got shot in the head or whatever, that's a little bit different. But this was this was good to have. A few guys were saved uh, from uh, perhaps getting killed because of the armored seat. That's, I don't know the material or Kevlar, whatever that does stop for. Uh, the the interior. I would, uh, some of the, the pictures you. Uh, this is not uh, original. We end up we had no navigation equipment when we got it. Came came back from Olympia with 
you know, see and meet on a, a map. But so then we put in a uh, kind of a glass cockpit and left a lot of the original uh, cages in there. But we've got nice navigation and train following and uh, 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 avoidance system on the thing. So that's a nice improvement that we did. Uh, but other than that, it, uh, we didn't have to do very much to it. This, this is the uh, cable cutter that you see. That was a, a post-Vietnam thing when, when we were flying around the United States. The cable cutter, supposedly, if you, you were flying low and whatever and didn't know what you were doing and doing something foolish, you hit the cable and that would maybe cut the cable off and, and not uh, destroy the aircraft. If you, right, yeah. And I think there were some saves here and there with it. But, uh, they, uh, the gunners didn't like that very well. It's not very functional. Uh, they they kind of just let the ammo go over their arm and talk to a few guys. And they had actually a sea ration can that they stuck right in there. It was a perfect fit. And so they uh, they had a box of ammo there and they, they would uh, have their one arm here and shooting and so forth. And then the ammo would come over their arm, go through the uh, sea ration can and not jam very often. Because these, uh, if they jammed on these, it was a real bear to get uh, get it on jammed and get ammo back in here. But if it was just freely going in, they could correct the problem quickly as a rule. No, it's uh, kind of pretty much straightforward because the engine up there and uh, the tail boom uh, is kind of a critical thing. You know, we, we had a little problems with the tail boom on it. Uh, a little crack in that once we had to repair it. Uh, uh, tail rotor, you know, you, if you lost a tail rotor, this aircraft, you have a, had a pretty good chance of getting it down without spinning like a top. That's the anti-torque rotor. So this blade system, it wants to spin it this way. That stops it. You lose that. But it's streamlined. You can keep the airspeed up and you can keep it flying forward because of that boom being enough to airstream it, uh, I guess you would call it or whatever. And then you would, uh, different things, some people you would run, try to run them on. Actually, a uh, guy that flew them for quite a bit uh, and flies with us, uh, Darren Skopik, we were just talking about that the other night. They most of the time did auto rotation. He lost the tail rotor, find a decent place, chop the power, and, uh, and go in, and uh, hopefully you know, had a better chance of uh, walking away from it. Yeah, it was called an auto rotation uh, that uh, if, you, uh, if you lose an engine or whatever, immediately get the collective down, get the pitch out of the blades, and then keep, uh, keep your rotor RPM up, which is your lift, uh, the airfoil. And when you got to where you think you wanted to land, uh, you get one pitch pull, and you get down to three, four feet or whatever, and uh, you take your pitch pull, and a lot of it works for the time. Can't really see it here very much. This is the N number, like on a regular aircraft. Uh, NX means it's experimental, 14. SD, that stands for uh, uh, Sheriff's Department in uh, uh, the Seattle area. And up front uh, is the serial number, if you want to take a quick shot of that. That's kind of hard to see too, but yeah. This is Vietnamese for danger. <laughs> New Yen Him. We didn't know that and I got Googled it. Oh, that's danger in Vietnamese. And they put that on it when they painted it up. Uh, that was in several uh, movies uh, as well.
My name is Connie Bolin. I am the uh, founder and now the coordinator for Warbridge and Review, but I'm just the one that comes out and says thanks for being here. And as you see, it takes a cast of a lot of people, maybe not thousands, but a lot of people to make this work like it does and bring it to the level that we have. I am very thankful to, for the Sleeping Dog crew. Scott Guyatt uh, is the leader of that, that group, very talented uh, individuals, and I asked them uh, uh, some time ago if they would uh, put a uh, camera in the room where they all work in this nice production room back here. So that's our Motley crew back here. Oh, I'm sorry. That is our professional crew that uh, coordinates uh, all of this that you see on the Jumbotron. But yeah, let's have a hand for Sleeping Dog Productions to Air to Air TV. Thank you, guys. Okay, and that room, that building behind me, uh, we have, uh, through the generosity and um, the dedication of Ron and Diane Fagan of Fagan Fighters World War II Museum in Granite Falls, Minnesota, Ron and Diane came to us a few years ago and said, you need a place to uh, allow these guys to do what they do so well. They donated this building to us. And then Scott's miracle Grow is our sustaining sponsor. So to Jim Hagedorn, Scott's miracle Grow Company, I say thank you. And I'll, I'll say take a couple of minutes to say thank you to the reenactors who are here early uh, in the program to show you about the uniforms and all the things that they do. They do a great job. Uh, so a round of applause for the reenactors again. Uh, thank you for that. I, I have to tell you, though, they have a little USO program over here uh, on Thursday nights, and they did a skit last night that was called War Bikes. They had their rusty bicycles behind them, and they did a takeoff on what I do this morning. So they have, my, uh, they have me down pretty well. There were a lot of really good lines, you know, of thanking this one. And, oh, I found this rusty bike, and thanks to my crew chief for helping me. But all that is true, uh, and uh, they're, they're great guys. So we have a really good program here. And uh, today uh, it is my honor to... Uh, have General Brady and uh, these aircraft here to bring a Vietnam presentation to you. I had another true honor yesterday morning. They asked me if I would give a ride to a Medal of Honor recipient, Kyle Carpenter. He went flying with me in the P-51 in the back seat of that airplane. And uh, he thought I was doing him a favor, but I can tell you that was a very moving experience. And what fun, what a great guy. He has a great picture uh, that he took a, a selfie as we did a roll uh, in that airplane. And uh, so it, it meant more to me than to him. So to all you veterans uh, who have uh, put yourselves out there and been willing to risk your life, for not only for your country, but mostly for your buddies. So with that, I'd like to ask if there are any Vietnam veterans in the audience, I'd like to ask you to stand up. Uh, and with that, I say welcome home. Thank you, guys. If you will direct your attention now to this uh, Jumbotron again behind me. After that uh, video is finished, uh, Brigadier General Retired Ed McElhenney will be our moderator today, and he will introduce our guest when the video is finished. Thank you. that we can look around it we can see people bigger stronger smarter than we are have more opportunity than we have but in the one way that we are all born equal is in matters of courage each of us can have all that we want you can't use it up it's the key to success it's the key to freedom Thank you. 
Good morning, folks. Welcome to Warbird and Review on, uh, yeah, it's Friday now. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we have a great program, as you can tell, and Connie is, oh, she's just moving a chair. Okay, that's fine. Um, I, I looked at the program that we've got today, and, and I had great difficulty in, in, in how I was going to orchestrate it. Um, I'm Ed McElhinney. Yeah, I'm a retired fighter pilot, um, and I got helicopters behind me. So it's, it's going to be difficult for me, but uh, please bear with me today. Um, but we are in the midst here of, of uh, a hero, and I, I can't, I, I don't know how many of you know General Brady's story, I guess is the best way to put it, um, but uh, I, I feel obligated to let everybody know exactly uh, what went on so many years ago. I, as a retired general officer also, I presented many medals and awards myself, um, and typically they started with attention to order. So bear with me for a minute, and I will say attention to order. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, Major Brady distinguished himself while serving in the Republic of Vietnam commanding a UH-1H ambulance helicopter. He volunteered to rescue wounded men from a site in enemy-held territory, which was supported to be heavily defended and to be blanketed by fog. To reach the site, he descended through heavy fog and smoke and hovered slowly along the valley trail, turning his ship sideward to blow the fog away with a backwash from his rotor blades. Despite the unchallenged close-range enemy fire, he found the dangerously small site where he successfully landed and evacuated two badly wounded South Vietnamese soldiers. He was then called to another area, completely covered by dense fog, where American casualties lay only 50 meters from the enemy. Two aircraft had been previously shot down, and others had made unsuccessful attempts to reach this site earlier in the day. With unmatched skill and extraordinary courage, Major Brady made four flights to this embattled landing zone and successfully rescued all the wounded. On his third mission of the day, Major Brady once again landed at a site surrounded by the enemy. The friendly ground force, pinned down by enemy fire, had been unable to reach and secure the landing zone. Although his aircraft had been badly damaged and his controls partially shot away during his initial entry into this area, he returned minutes later and returned the remaining injured. Shortly thereafter, obtaining a replacement aircraft, Major Brady was requested to land in an enemy minefield where a platoon of American soldiers was trapped. A mine detonated near his helicopter, wounding two crew members and damaging his ship. In spite of this, he managed to fly six severely injured patients to medical aid. Throughout that day, Major Brady utilized three helicopters to eva uh, evacuate a total of 51 seriously wounded men, many of whom would have perished without prompt medical treatment. Major Brady's bravery was in highest traditions of the military service and reflects great credit upon himself and the United States Army. This is the man who is here. Stay down. Okay. Stay down. Stay. That's fine. That's fine. <clears throat> I had to do that. I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, now you all know that part of the story. And there's much more after that. He made a comment. He said, you know, he said, what was it in, in the book? You said earning the Medal of Honor you thought was sometimes easier than wearing it. And that's an interesting comment. We'll talk about that later. But as we go on, you can see we got two beautiful airplanes, uh, excuse me, aircraft here. I, uh, yeah, I'm a fighter pilot, okay. Um, a UH-1H, uh, and we got the Sikorsky over here. We got the owners uh, both here. We've got uh, Dave Schmitz, um, who's going to be talking a little bit about the UH-1 later, and uh, Mike Schneider, and he's got the Sikorsky. We'll be talking about that later. The sequence of events, I think we're going to talk to General Brady for a little bit here, and then we're going to talk about each of the other airplanes. We'll do a quick walk around, um, and then we'll open it up to questions. So uh, that's what I propose, and, uh, and with that, General Brady, I'm going to open it up to you and, uh, and just say, 
I, I, I have a thousand questions. He's got a book, by the way, and there's going to be a signing later in the, uh, the uh, museum or in the, uh, the bookstore over there. Um, and uh, I've read the book. Um, interesting, interesting stories. Um, and you flew dust off. Um, tell us a little bit about the mission. The, uh, do we got, I know we've got a lot of v uh, Vietnam veterans here. Uh, from Vietnam, right? Raise your hand, guys. I, just, I know there's quite a few here. Uh, any of you ever picked up by dust off? Yeah, here we go. Good. Well, that, it was it, it. The story, much of the story, is in my uh, in the book about the origins of dust off and how, how successful it was and the techniques we used to get into the battlefield. And so I always usually start with a war story. It kind of tells you what we did. You all know the difference between a war story and a fairy tale. A war story, a fairy tale begins with once upon a time and a war story begins with this is no shit. <laughs> so we were, and we were called out one day to kind of give you an idea to a pickup site uh, in a combat area uh, the people on the ground were wounded Marines. And as is always the case with the Marines, there's a lot of confusion down there. <laughs> Got some Marines here. I don't want you to think I'm saying anything disparaging about another service, but for you Marines, disparaging is bad. <laughs> so if you've ever uh, been in a deal, you got we got a dry riverbed here. You got kind of a tree line here. You got an open rice paddy and surrounded by trees here. And the enemy is in this tree line. And the patients are here. And the friendlies are here. And so I'm flying with this young warrant officer and uh, made a nice approach into the area. We dropped down into the riverbed, scoot along behind the trees, jumped up over the trees, turned our tail into the fire. You always did that. You did not want the bullets to come through the windshield. Better that they came through the transmission. So you always did that, and you went out the same way that you came in. Well, if you've ever been in a situation like that where they're crawling around, nobody will stand up, and they're shouting and shooting, and it's just a mess, you know what it's like to pucker. And pucker is when the cheeks from the lower part of your body slowly begin to envelop your ears. And so we're sitting there all puckered up, and you also try to shrink yourself. You just try to become just as small as you can. And you're sitting up here, and everybody's crawling around down here. And so we're shrunk up, we're puckered, and I look over at my co-pilot, and his head's going like this all over the cockpit. I thought that's strange. Strange guy. Back to the patients. Let's get him on. Let's get the heck out of here. And then back to my buddy, and there his head is like that. And I couldn't help myself. I broke down. I laughed out loud. And he didn't miss a stroke. He said, laugh, you son of a bitch, but it's harder to hit a moving target. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a true story. <clears throat> By the way, that pilot, if you heard the story about... The guy who confiscated a Huey and tried to fly it into the White House, he was the Maryland State Patrol helicopter pilot that got between that, that helicopter and the White House. We looked for him for years. We thought he was killed in an under, underground drug thing or something. And I heard his voice on a radio in Maryland. Talk. He was ready, getting ready to go have lunch with the President of the United States. So that's how we found the guy. Great pilot, even though he was trying to be a moving target. <clears throat> but the key, the key for us in dust off was to find ways to get in during the battlefield. And if you used your imagination and if you looked at the terrain and you knew where the friendlies were and you knew where the enemy was and you knew what weapons the guy had and you'd mix and mingle that in, a highway would actually spring out of the sky and show you how to get in that, that area. And so we did find different ways to get into different areas. And they talk about blowing away the smoke or the fog or whatever. I mean, where does it go? You can't blow it away. And the way we found this technique was one day 
In Vietnam, as you guys know, <clears throat> in the afternoon, the clouds built up on the outpost in the mountains. In the morning, you had low valley fog, about 500 feet, just like a snowbank. And we got a call. I just gone back to Vietnam for my second tour, and I had a bunch of young uh, warrant officer aviators uh, right out of flight school. All their names started with an S. They all thought they were handpicked to fly dust off. Somebody just grabbed these guys and gave them to me. And they never had any experience at all. And But they were eager. They were ready to go. And I was worried about the weather. And I was worried about the mountains. And I know they would not stop. And I was worried about how to do these, especially these weather missions. So we got a call one day for a kid <clears throat> who was on the one of the outposts. And he'd been bitten by a snake. And those snakes in Vietnam, you know, it's like, lay down so you don't hurt yourself falling, because they were pretty deadly. And so initially we went into the area, and I knew I could fall out because it was uh, VFR under the clouds, but they were in the clouds on the top of the outpost. We start up into the outpost, and of course you get all screwed up, but I fall out in the valley, broke out, back up again, couldn't figure out how in the hell am I going to get in there. I could not see. So the crew's nervous. The guys are shouting at me, dust off, please, please hurry. He's going into convulsions. So I went back. I said, okay, guys, we got one more time. So we went around and started back up again. And I was totally disoriented and the gust of wind blew me sideways, and I always had my window down on the right side. And I was sure we were going in, so I looked out the window hoping to find a hole in the jungle, and guess what? I could see the tip of the rotor blade, and I could see the top of the trees. So I knew I was right side up. And I says, damn. So I turned that sucker sideways. You could, you have to go very, very slow. This, the, the, the fog doesn't blow away. It's there, but you can see 20 feet to the end of your rotor blade, and if you've got two reference points, you can do it. We did it. First time. I got the guy to the hospital, and I think he lived. We used that technique from then on to get into uh, low valley fog areas and also uh, patients who are in the top of the mountains. That was one technique. We had a lot of other ones, too. General Brady, how, well, first of all, I need to warn you, you've got a former Marine sitting next to you, oh, so, so be very, very <laughs> careful, okay? So, yeah, I'm surprised he didn't smack you or something like that, but I guess rank has its privileges, right? So, uh. <laughs> um, I, I will say, you know, this day and age, we, we navigate with GPS and all that kind of stuff. How about your navigation techniques? You know, you, you read the citation, and you went to a variety of places, and weather was obviously a problem. You know, I mean, did you go out by, by radial and DME, or were you so familiar with the, the terrain and, and other references out there? How did you navigate? No, there was, there was uh, we had maps, <clears throat> and I'll tell you, here's how it worked with dust off after we finally got the resource refined. Uh, we were off the ground in two minutes in a Huey, and uh, the average time from the time the guy was shot until we had him in an operating room was 33 minutes. <clears throat> so if, if the odds of you getting shot in a jungle in Vietnam and surviving were greater than if you were in an accident in a highway in America because of that helicopter. But there was no nav aids, no nothing. Uh, what you did was uh, the, the co-pilot ran to the aircraft, cranked it. The aircraft commander went to the operations, and we got a heading, and we got a distance to the pickup site. The first thing you do when you lift off is you let the guy in the jungle know we're on the way because they're worried about his wounded friends, uh, his buddies, and they need to know that help is on the way. So you let them know. Now, as you get into the area, that's when you start analyzing the terrain, the enemy location, the friendly location, what signal. In the early days, we had problems with signals because it was all Vietnamese. And we, couldn't, they, we couldn't talk to them, but we could say, smoke, whatever. And they would say, green smoke is out, dust off. And guess what? You'd look down there, and you'd find four or five green smokes. 
And we went into some wrong areas a little bit before we finally wised up. And so then after that, we would say, you got smoke, Raj. Okay, here's the deal. You pop smoke, I will identify the color. And so that we know it's you, and we're coming a very simple thing. But it saved us a lot of heartaches uh, compared to the, f the first few times when we went into the wrong smoke, smoke thing. But essentially, uh, heading, distance, frequency, call sign, that's all we need. Now, if we had trouble finding him, if he was alert, if it was a lerp guy or something, you needed a hoist, uh, then oftentimes we would use our FM homer uh, to get in and, and find him. Uh, the, the worst missions at this time, more of our people were being killed at night and in weather than were being killed by the enemy. We were losing a lot of crews, a lot of aircraft, because they were flying in the mountains, and they were flying at night, get disoriented, and, and uh, crash. So those, those, were, those were the things, but we found a way to do the weather in the daytime, and later on we found a way to do the weather at night. understand. How about, you know, the, 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 the mission that you earned the Medal of Honor on? Uh, you, you went back and forth several times. Uh, what's a typical crew for your, your dust-off mission? How many guys? Crew? You, okay. We had a, a pilot, co-pilot, medic, and a crew chief. Okay. And did any of them ever look at you and go, you're nuts, I don't want to go with you, um, and this is too dangerous? Or are you guys all on the same sheet of music? Well, I, you, uh, we had some cases where they would come back and never fly again. And so, uh, but not, did not happen very often. The most important thing, for example, the day of the Medal of Honor, we used the technique to go into the fog uh, to pick up the two Vietnamese uh, wounded. Uh, there, I was not on duty that day, but they called me because it was a weather mission and, and we knew how to do that. And then when we were lifting out of there, we heard about Actually, they say 51. There were 70 patients in a valley in the same kind of circumstances. And so we said, they've been, they've been there all night. Why, why hasn't somebody got them out? And so we went out to LZ West, but they, wouldn't let, they were not going to let me go in. And so the brigade commander then talked to my co-pilot, and he said, we can do it. Just give us a frequency. Just tell us who we're talking to, and we'll go get them. They were actually in the fog right below the base. And so you got to have a willing co-pilot, and you got to have willing crew members. And when you got that, the crew works together. There's no problems. But if you got somebody that's afraid, or somebody that's not willing, or worried, or some way uh, not really dedicated to the mission, uh, that's not good. Mm -hmm. Everybody on the team has to be together, and we all have to have to be dedicated to getting that wounded guy out. And you go after him like you'd want somebody to come after you or the way you'd want somebody to come after your wounded relative or friends. You just give it all you got. Mm -hmm. Who was the initiator of the, uh, the dust-off mission? Who started all that? This, this was all started by Charles Kelly, and he was a World War II veteran. I, I write about him in my book. We just came back from Vietnam three or four weeks ago, well, actually in early May. And we dedicated a memorial to him there near the spot where he was killed. But he was killed trying to rescue some people uh, in a very trying time when they were trying to use portable red crosses. It's a complicated story, but he gave his life to save dust off, which eventually saved, in Vietnam alone, a million lives. And from then on to today, who knows how many lives it stayed in Afghanistan and Iraq, but the call sign is still dust off, and that was Charles Kelly's dust off. His dying words when he landed in an area, a hot area, and they said, get out, get out, we're under fire. Uh, his dying words, when I have your wounded, he took a round right through the heart and killed him on the spot. Uh, but those are the inspiration for dust off pilots, the standard for dust off pilots and combat medics to this day. So he was probably the most remarkable soldier I ever met. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay, how about um, a typical day as a dust-off pilot? I mean, did you, <coughs> you work, um, you know, 12 hours and just, again, on alert, basically? Um, it's 20, 24 hours. Okay. We, as I said, uh, or maybe that was earlier, we, in a nine-and-a-half-month period with six assigned UH-1H models, 
Only one time we would have three flyable, three that were flyable. In a nine and a half month period, we evacuated over 21,000 patients. Now those same aircraft, there was more than us. All the dust off units in Vietnam were doing the same thing. So we averaged something like 28 combat missions a day, four at night, 16 hours flying time every day. We were on 24 hours at a time, first up ship, second up ship, and the third one was a hoist. And so uh, we rigged a, a, a horn to a battery thing, and so when the horn went off, if it was the first aircraft, one blast, second aircraft, two blasts, and, and then we <clears throat> ran to the aircraft, and as I said, we were off the ground in two minutes. I think uh, the most challenging uh, but the weather missions in the daytime, but the most challenging missions were night weather missions. And as I said, that was killing it. And I'll tell you quickly how we found out how to solve that problem. <clears throat> I was out, you got low valley or uh, flat terrain here, and then you go into the mountains. And the mountains went up to about, this was in the Chulai area. The mountains went up to the five or 6,000 feet, I think and valleys and things in between them. And so one day I'm sitting out in the valley on a quiet mission. And, uh, the, you know, if you've ever been at night like that where the tracers and the flares and everything, it's just kind of, it's kind of pretty, really. <laughs> and so you're sitting there, and I'm, I'm looking at the scenery, and then I, here's, a, here's a mountain. And the mountain is in the clouds all the way down here. And I look, and a flare come down by that mountain. I could see the silhouette of that mountain. And it, I didn't think anything of it at the time, but it just kind of stuck in my head. So fast forward a, a couple of weeks or so, we get a call from the 101st, and they're out in an area that was uh, called Dis Valley, and they had a whole bunch of wounded, and it's in the middle of a tropical uh, storm. And so I tried to use a technique that we used in the Delta, which at night in the Delta with all the canals and everything, you could get on a canal and with your searchlight, you could follow it like a highway right into the pickup zone. Very easy navigation, no wires, no mountains, no nothing. It was beautiful, no problem at night. Mountains are a different deal. And so, uh, I initially tried to follow a river up into the place, but it was raining so hard that it was coming off the window and it was blinding me. And you would have a crew chief in the front and a crew chief in the back, and you'd watch for a light in front of you, and you'd watch for a light behind you. In case you got stuck, you could turn around and get out of there. Well, it was like ink. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't get up that river. And then I had this friggin' vision of that mountain in the clouds. But I had a D-model Huey, and it did not have good instruments on it. And so I knew how I was going to do it. I went back, got another airplane uh, with a transponder and another crew. And then I told them, I want a vector to the pickup site. I'm going to go to about 6,000 feet IFR to the pickup site. Air Force flare ship was at 9,000 feet. And I says, I want you guys to drop flares and I'm going to see if I can circle those flares down through the mountains and get in, use my FM homer to get in and pick up those guys. And so the Air Force guy's not sure what's going on and the son of a gun stopped the flares when I'm about 1,500 feet in 3,000 foot mountains. But the beautiful thing about the Huey was you just stop it and just straight up. You don't dare go any direction because you'll hit a mountain. So I finally got the guy trained and so he kept the flare in the, in the sky, lighted all the time. And we came down through that stuff, and we got in there, and we got those wounded out. ITO, up above the mountains, back to the hospital. We circle over the ocean until we saw the lights of Chulai, and then we go into the hospital. So we made four trips that night, doing this, using the same technique, and we got every one of them out. And after that... We were never stopped by night weather, nor were we ever stopped by day weather. We never left a patient in the field, period. Wow. I, I will say it's really nice these days to have night, night vision goggles. Um, and that was way before that. 
All right, you were talking about the UE. This is the exact model UE that you flew. Is that correct? A UE yeah. UE-20H. Okay. Let's, uh, let's shift gears for a second. I'll give you a break, and we're going to let Dave talk a little bit about his aircraft. First of all, Dave, thank you so much to bring it here. Um, it is a beautiful aircraft. And uh, all right, tell us a little bit about the acquisition. You know, where did it come from? Well, it came from uh, Olympia, Washington, uh, where we bought it from uh, Northwest Helicopters in 19, uh, 2015. Uh, just uh, happened, uh, my partner uh, came to me at a, I flew T6s for quite a few years, and uh, could, we were at a safety meeting in Minneapolis, and uh, Barry says, uh, Dave, I want to talk to you after the meeting. Okay, and uh, so the meeting was over. What's up, Barry? He said, well, I want to, uh, my son and I want to buy a Huey. I said, all right, well, how much time you got in the helicopters? Well, none, but uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to flight school. Said, okay, well, let's just start. Uh, and I had just been in the uh, trader plane, uh, and uh, I saw there were a couple for sale, and uh, so then that's what's where it started. Okay, but but there's more to that. I told you, as former Marine, but but what did you fly for the Marines? I flew CH-46. Uh, uh, I was in uh, uh, Vietnam, 69, 70, and HMM 364 uh, at. Uh, Marble Mountain. Okay, so 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 he was a Marine CH forty six kind of guy there. So yeah. so he's okay. Um, but <clears throat> okay, so you you acquired it. Was there a great deal of restoration required? Actually, no. It was pretty well restored. It uh, it was in Vietnam in uh, 66, 67 and damaged. And uh, we've got uh, kind of a history on it. And it was uh, returned uh, to the states, which is kind of unusual for Huey. And uh, went to Corpus Christi uh, and was re. Uh, Redone and then flew around uh, the country in uh, uh, guard units and and it was in uh, Savannah, Georgia, where when I actually was Army trained, uh, I was in uh, OCS, got out of OCS in uh, uh, June of '68, uh, and Pensacola was backlogged and the the Marines, and the Navy got a, a few slots in the Army, so. Uh, I went uh, TAD to the Army for nine months. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's okay, right? He got his <laughs> Army training. Uh, so, uh, so they didn't know what to do with us uh, down in uh, Fort Walters or uh, in, in Savannah. They just left us alone. Just We, we just flew uh, and uh, turned out uh, good. And uh, my uh, fellow uh, Navy train, uh, they used to call us uh, Army pukes. Uh, and uh, so we'd end up calling them Navy pukes or whatever. But when we got to Vietnam, I had 100, uh, 208 hours, I believe, in uh, helicopters and 80 hours in Huey in flight school. And uh, we could fly the, a helicopter they, uh, coming out of the na uh, Navy in the Pensacola. They only had 80 hours in 34s or uh, uh, I think they uh, 206s, something like that. So when I started flying with it, hey, you guys can fly. So I, we didn't get called Army Pukes for too awfully long. And, uh, so... Uh, it was, it was interesting, but uh, I, uh, I enjoyed my time in the Army, but I, I went back in the Marines after I uh, got out of flight school. Outstanding. Okay. And I'll ask General Brady, what, you know, th this is, how much time you got in one of these things? In the Huey? Yeah. I haven't got a lot of time. Probably uh, all of it was in, in Vietnam. Most of my time in the Huey was in Vietnam, and it's about uh, 17, 1800 hours uh, okay. in, in Vietnam. But we flew, uh, I mean, this, I can't tell you what a joy it was uh, to, to have this thing when we got to Vietnam. Before that, they had the H-13. It took both feet, both legs, and a wrist to fly one of those things. And it, is, it does with the 34, too, I think, right? You still got that damn thing? <laughs> yep. In a 19, I swear to God, well, we flew single ship, single pilot missions in the 19, and it was it's like this bird, not as big, not as good, but at the end of the day, your left wrist and your left leg were just absolutely worn out, and you had to transfer fuel, and you had to read maps and do all that, but that, I think, made me a better pilot, because when I got in this thing, I mean, you just jerked that sucker off the ground, and it would pick up anything you could put on it. And we were talking the other day <clears throat> about how many patients, how many is the most patients you ever got on that thing. And uh, my co-pilot said one night we picked up a guy named Webster Anderson who was a, 
later on became a Medal of Honor recipient, but he was he was on a mountaintop in a tropical storm. We used the flares and everything, and my co-pilot, who kept the record after the after action report, said we, we had 21 people on there, 21 American soldiers. And another pilot recently, I heard, said he had 27 on there. Now, if you've got women and children, uh, then you can get them. But we did not use we did not use litters unless it was a head or a neck thing, and uh, you stacked them in there because you knew you were going to have them in an operating room in 15 minutes or so, and that was the key to saving their life. Stop the stop the blood. You know, you protect what they got of one, and you make sure they're getting the other, and that's blood and air. And with those two things, uh, 15 minutes, double amputees, sucking, ch you name it, and we get them in the operating room and they're going to live. I forget the numbers exactly, but Vietnam set survival records never before to this day paralleled in combat. I think 10% of our people were wounded in Vietnam, uh, and of that 10% who were wounded, less than 1% died. And so if we got our hands on you, you were going to live, unless you're already dead. And so that was just a basic fact, and the, the troops really appreciated that. But this was, this was it. It was not so much us. We had a, mach a machine that we had faith in, that we knew could do anything we asked it to do, and, uh, and was, was great in the jungle. It was quick. It had a nice attitude. For approach at night, we we flew blacked out. We had no lights on at night, and we did not use lights when we landed. <clears throat> so you had to have a signal on the ground, and it could be one of my pilots landed at one night to a flicking Zippo lighter. And so if you've got a a light and you you could take this thing, you could stop it above the trees, and then you could tilt it, and then you keep that light between you and the ground, and uh, you don't need a searchlight. They don't want you to use a searchlight because it exposes their position. And it'll get you down there, and then the crew will tell you when you can set it down. And so couldn't do it, couldn't, could not have done it without this bird. It was, it was a lifesaver. And by the way, it's the most combat experienced aircraft in history. The Air Force weenies with all their fighter pilots and all that crap. I mean, and this, this bird has uh, 7 million combat hours or something, more Medal of Honor recipients except for one, one World War II aircraft, I think. I had a friend who ran a museum out in Seattle, the Museum of Flight. He's got all these fixed wing aircraft and I said for God's sakes why don't you put a real airplane in here those people don't fly they ride you only really fly a helicopter everybody knows that so the guy had a lot of money but it took him a long time and finally we got a, a Huey helicopter in the Museum of Flight in Seattle and more people visit that than any of the other aircraft there and that's understandable because it's better than all the rest of them Okay, I think the interview is over. I, I, <laughs> I knew that was coming, General. Uh, I, it was just a question of when, that's all. So uh, I, I accept the, uh, the hits, and uh, what can I say? Um, but I will go on, shift gears a little bit, and talk to Mike a little bit about his aircraft that's here. And oh, by the way, there's bullet holes. We said bullet holes in the floorboards of the UE over there that have been patched up. Is that right? We think so. Uh, the uh, uh, the skin was is, was repaired, but there's certain unidentifiable holes uh, in the floor. Okay. Right. Yeah. And that brings me to the Skorsky over there, because I guess there's a lot of bullet holes in that thing. Yeah. And Mike, I'll say again, thank you so much for bringing it here. It is a, a beautiful aircraft. And uh, tell us a little bit about acquisition of that. First of all, with utmost respect to the general. When I joined the Navy, they told us we were going to take care of the Air Force, the Army, the Marine Corps. So basically, that's what they told us. So we, we kind of felt like we, we took care of you guys. So There you go. But okay. Thank you. That's the, one hit the, back. Yeah. Okay. okay. The Sikorsky has uh, 54 documented bullet holes, and it has some damage history. Uh, in Vietnam, it uh, basically was uh, the second time it was um, uh, damaged, it was sent to Japan. That's how it basically 
survived. It uh, uh, was up there when the uh, HMM 362 squadron in 1968, they were told to go home and they gave all the rest of the uh, helicopters to the South Vietnamese. And um, this one was up in Japan, was sent to the States, flew in a Guardian a couple of years and then sent to Davis Mothin. Mm -hmm. And you got a crew chief out here that's got some real background with it, yes. is that right? Ed Tatman. We had five crew chiefs at one time within the Tulsa, about 100 miles of Tulsa area that actually flew in the squadron with this helicopter. And Ed is uh, one of the ones that came with us today uh, from Tulsa. He lives in Stigler, Oklahoma, and uh, he flew on in this unit uh, in 1967, 68. The, the crew chiefs... By the way, the crew chiefs were our parachute. I mean, of all the soldiers of every kind of training imaginable that I ever served with, the helicopter crew chief was the finest trained, most capable, most competent soldier I ever served with. Just that simple. And I'll pass it over to Ed for a minute. Any comments right now, Ed, about uh, serving and, and that particular aircraft? Are we ready here? Yeah. Uh, did your engineers, producers want us out here? Yeah, that's fine. You're, okay. you're good. Uh, I appreciate the comments, and, and uh, I would say, and kind of going back and, and to honor our, our general, uh, to me, every time you've climbed in that cockpit, you've got to understand what these pilots went through. I cannot, in my wildest imagination, imagine sitting up there holding that stick in a hover and in some cases, we would have this wheel on a rock, and it might be two or 3,000 feet off the side right here, and uh, knowing at any time that could end. And uh, to sit there and hold those sticks uh, while we're trying to do our job and everything, uh, just beyond imagination to me. So uh, no disrespect to the one mission. I think you should have got one every time you got behind the stick. And, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I've been flying with this aircraft since uh, uh, 99. We've been going 23 years. Uh, we lost our leader in 15 and things slowed down tremendously. Just took the wind out of her sails and, and uh, he was the driving force that uh, uh, was behind us and, and so on. He was a non-military man. He was totally civilian. And uh, uh, so he bought this thing for a uh, parts vehicle to support another 34 for lift and uh, so he pushed it to the back of the hangar for 12 14 years it was stacked full of pieces when they picked it up in 1985 this young man Jesse step out here just a little bit this is the son of Mike he is our second generation pilot, and when we're gone, he's gonna carry on. I'm not gonna tell you his age, but in 1985, he was 10 years old. They went, <laughs> they went to Tucson, Arizona to pick this aircraft up, and whoever was in charge of the yard there says, boys, help me clean this up load everything you can in it. And I think you loaded about 18 or 20 of these blades and they had to walk them back into the tail pylon to get them in there. And then they had to kind of glove them like this and then stuff uh, foam rubber they could find and uh, uh, things on top of them to protect them and so on. And of course, they're the most valuable thing. They don't reproduce those and they do time out. And when they time out, they go in a scrap pile or go on a static display somewhere. And uh, uh, Jesse rode down in the old truck and, and their air conditioner was uh, what we affectionately referred to when I was a kid as a, a 265. That's two wing windows turned in and 65 mile an hour and about 105 degree heat. And, uh, but they got down there and, and uh, trucked that thing full of parts and brought it home. It went in the hangar for 10, 12, 15 years. The lift business did not materialize. Another business was lucrative enough to, to keep them going. And it was just kind of forgotten until a guy called and wanted to purchase some parts out of it. And Gerald, uh, our, our leader, got in that thing and, and went to digging around and he found 
a cardboard box in there with the log books and stuff in it for this aircraft. And him being a civilian type individual, he went to leafing through it and uh, found uh, entries that said battle damage at station such and such and battle damage at station such and such. And, and so he called Mike, Mike uh, being a military man, he told him this and Mike says, Gerald, I think you've got a warbird up there. So they got the log book down and got to doing a little more dissecting and, and decided they did. Uh, went to putting it back together, the mission changed. Uh, went to putting it back together. What you see here is just almost 100% original. The interior of this aircraft has never been touched except for probably a power wash. I think when it came out of the desert, it had probably an inch of, of sand in it and dirt and debris. and, and uh, the outside has been rubbed and scrubbed. When we get back out to our location, we've got a picture that's got the bullet holes targeted and uh, uh, kind of give you some idea. And if you look through the cargo door, you, you can look right at three or four of them right in there. There's one of them for a six foot tall man. It is straight in the door, right behind one of the seats. And when we get back out there, I'll try to drop the back of that Kansas uh, that canvas seat a little bit where you can see that damage. Uh, it's, it sticks out pretty clearly there. And of course, when you go to the other side and look at that picture, why, uh, you'll know what it is. Uh, this has been a tremendous ride. Uh, we take it as a learning tool to schools. We can do things, them guys, excuse me, General. We can do things these guys with them wings that stick out like that can't do. We can put it in a schoolyard. This aircraft's been in over 200 schoolyards and probably as many veterans events and, and on and on and on uh, in the 23, 23 years we've been going since 1999. Uh, it's a healing tool. We get around behind it every once in a while, uh, have a little prayer meeting back there. It's an educational tool, it's a healing tool, and it's also a flying memorial to 33 of our squadron mates that paid the ultimate sacrifice right here. And uh, so uh, obviously we, we feel like that thing demands uh, the first respect for sure. And I uh, had a young man walk by yesterday, I'm getting too old to fight, fair, and uh, he was pushing the bassinet and had a couple of families with him. Uh, and they kind of rolled up and, and he said, if you've seen one aware plane, you've seen them all. And I stood and, and thought about that and visited with Jesse. Uh, I'm getting to where I think these things out a little better than I did at one time. <laughs> yeah. And part of me just almost went and invited him to come over and read this, give it a minute, and get away from the aircraft. It's not just another old airplane. And, the, and all these airplanes, or most of them out here, the warbirds especially, have got tails to tail. Uh, let, uh, let's let Jesse, if we can, can we do that, Jim? We're gonna, uh, uh, we were gonna do a walk around and, and, and talk a little pilot stuff. We're running out of time. Um, so I'm going to save that until like after the questions, and we're going to open it up to questions because I'm sure people have, have got questions about the aircraft. Um, but I just want to end the formal portion here with a, a, this is the, the last part of your book, General Brady, and I, I, I found it very interesting. And this, oh. is, this is something if, yeah, you're in trouble now. I'm, I'm going to try to get even. No, I'm not going to get even. Um, but uh, he makes a... Uh, poignant comment here, and I'll read it. It says, whatever happens to our bodies as we age, our minds are not devoid of romance and we still dream. In my dreams, I am again a captain, not a general. Hurrying into the mist of the moist morning fog or inky blackness, climbing into the cabin, surrounded by the sweet cell of JP4, strapping in to the detent, the trigger, the sweet, sweet smell of JP4, um, the whining engine, the bumpy roar and off across tracer mark terrain. Voices in my ear begging for wounded comrades. Hurry, dust off. 
Then the signal, the terrain, the enemy, the highway, down on the collective, forward on the cyclic, kick it out of trim, hard over to the ground, dodging trees, dipping into paddies, snaking forward swiftly, stop, hard left pedal, right cyclic, a fast flat turn, no float, down to the ground. Confusion, we got them, clear on the right, the left, oops, the sharp crack of gunfire snapping through our bird, crew okay, no red lights, up, steady, right pedal rotating into translational, speed, then altitude, then more speed, full bore ahead into the caring hands of a physician and life. And that was in the tail end of his book, and you can see what this man is really concerned about. And this isn't the general, this is the captain, and he still dreams that. Thank you, General Brady. All right, we got about eight minutes right now, not a lot of time, but I'm going to open it up to questions. And then afterwards, like I said, General Brady is going to be signing books back in the, uh, uh, that building right there. And, uh, and I highly recommend the book. Um, I will also say thank you to American Airlines. Uh, American Airlines uh, helped you out in getting here, from what I understand. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, they used to be my former employer for about 33 years also. Oh. So I, I appreciate, the, appreciate the, uh, the, the ride they gave you and their support. Um, and with that, we'll open it up to quick questions. Go ahead, up the top there. Uh, so General, first I'd like to say thanks for the presentation you gave today. It was very interesting. From a pilot's perspective, um, I was curious, because you hear a lot of stories about heavily damaged Hueys getting their crews back and surviving you know, these, these dust-off missions. Is there something special about the Huey that gave it that sort of robustness and ability to take hits and, and stay in the air? Well, it, it did not have uh, armor. It was, you can't do that much to a helicopter, but we did have... Uh, what, what, what's that Kevlar? We had a Kevlar thing here on our side that you could slide out after you got into it. And we all carried a pistol. And guess where we put that pistol? That was it. <laughs> and some of them would put, uh, put a, uh, something in the bubble down there. So you didn't have a lot of protection, but the bird did take a lot of punishment. And you could uh, fill the rotor blades with bullets. Uh, the most beautiful advance from the old uh, air helicopters, some of, the gr some of the hardest training we had in the early days was to get into a burning ship and get the wounded out. Somebody created a fuel cell. That sucker didn't burn. Of all the crash sites, and we were just talking about this, of all the crash sites I went into Vietnam, I don't think, I can't remember off the top of my head, any of them that caught on fire. So that bird would go to the ground and uh, crash, but it didn't burn. And the saying in the early days of my flying was, if you don't get killed in the crash, you'll burn to death. But the Huey had a beautiful cell, even with the tracer. Uh, it would take a lot of rounds and still keep on flying. And uh, the... The, the only thing that would stop it, really, uh, from getting to the ground is if you killed the pilot and the co-pilot. Then there was an issue. But the bird, no matter how many rounds it took, unless it hit something, uh, something really vital, the transmission was the most dangerous thing because if that blade stopped, then you're dead. But as long as the blade's moving and uh, you got controls and nobody's hurt, you can get that thing to the ground on a dime. We used to, in training, we'd turn the engine off and shoot auto rotations, try to see who could hit a spot closer than the other guy. And now they'll, they won't do that. They'll shoot auto rotations to about 50 feet and then recover, which, I mean, you're not gonna crash at 50 feet. What the hell good does that do you? <laughs> But uh, no, I, I can't tell you how much I love this bird and how many lives that it saved. And we were just instruments. But it was this, this, this wonderful machine uh, was so quick and so powerful uh, that uh, saved lives and could take so much battle damage and still survive that I can't tell you how many friends I have who have crashed this thing I don't know how many times and are still walking around. Another question right here. General, um, dust off 39 out of Pleiku, 1968. Ah. Oh. That's not a dust off bird. Would you explain? Well, it's got guns on it. So we People never. need to know that. 
Huh? People need to know that. Well, they do. the the you know they talk a lot about the uh, uh, Geneva Accords and everything. We were armed, but uh, we we had a rifle, and I got I got all my guys' pistols too. Uh, the crew chief and the gunner, or the crew chief and the medic had a rifle and a pistol because they had to leave the bird, go into the jungle, and drag the patients out, and they could not be unarmed while they were doing that. And you can't carry an M16 and a, and a person at the same time. So we were armed to protect ourselves and to protect our patients. And so that's, that's why we were armed. Now, there were some dust-off medevac units who actually mounted uh, w weapons, which is really stupid. Because it takes, you have to get one more person on there, on each side, to man the damn thing. You can't hit shit with it. I don't care who you are. You can't hit anything with it. And you don't know where the fire is coming from. So why, and the worst thing is the noise. When I would tell them, don't shoot. No mad minute. I don't want to hear anything when I come in. I don't, don't shoot. The first time I went in, everybody's shooting like crazy, and the guys in the back are shooting like crazy, and the damn hot rounds are going down the back of my <laughs> flight suit, and I think I'm dead. <laughs> so no shooting, quiet, nice quiet approach. Then, if you hear somebody shooting, you know it's the bad guy, and you could do, you could do whatever you have to do to get the hell out of there. So there's conflicting thoughts. Some guys, one guy, one of my pilots talked about gunships and shooting and all that, and I finally said, what good does it do? And he says, well, it makes me feel better. <laughs> and I thought, what the hell have I got here? But, so it's not, uh, I, I, the guns, uh, as I said, the medevacs from the first cab, not the first cab, but the 101st, or the, yeah, the first cab, I think they mounted machine guns on the side of their aircraft, which were just stupid. Really, took up space, more weight, less room for patients, and you can't hit anything. You know, uh, we in the early days, we were trying to teach our pilots how to shoot if they had to out of a helicopter. Guess what? You shoot behind the target. Now, how long does it take to teach a guy to shoot behind the target? It's difficult. We had an area where we had a bunch of peacocks, and we had lanes going down through there, and these guys would practice on the peak. Believe me, those peacocks were perfectly safe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got that perspective down. Thank you. All right, another question up here. Um, you mentioned that uh, the crew was uh, a medic and the two pilots and uh, the crew chief, and then there was also a gunner, correct? No? Not on my bird. No? There was a gunner, your crew members, the, the, the crew chief and the medic were your protect. If you got into an area and you're on the ground and you start receiving fire and you see where it's coming from, they were armed and they could return the fire. Oh, but okay. I discouraged that. Right. And uh, because, you know, just to hit a guy in the jungle, it's just wasting ammo. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing was to get in there and out as fast as you could no, we did not. I never, would never carry a gunner. Although, as I said, the medevac helicopters in the first cab did have gunners. Total waste. Okay, thank you. All right, other questions? Okay, we got one over here. How long could the Huey stay up in the air? We, we counted, uh, for my purposes, we counted for about two hours. Is that about right? And then at the end of two hours, uh, the 20-minute warning light would come on. And the one thing you knew when that light came on, you didn't have 20 minutes. So that was the limit. And so we had, beautiful thing about it was my second tour, my first tour, we actually refueled in 55-gallon drums with a chamois cloth out in the middle of the patties. Second tour, we refueled hot and we could refuel. So we'd go 15 hours without getting out of the seat uh, without any problem at all because they had fuel for us everywhere and hospitals too. And that was the most important thing. That's why our missions were so quick, you know, 33 minutes from the time the guy shot until he's in an operating room. You just, you're just not going to die. 
Mike, I got a quick question. You talked about Armin. We got the uh, the M60s here. How about Armin on the uh, Sikorsky? What was uh, what was standard? Same thing. Okay. Two M60s. Yeah, one on this side and the other one on the other side. Okay. All right. Another question. Anybody anywhere yeah, over got here? A one. Uh, we got. Oh, got a youngster. <laughs> that guy looks like he's going to be a helicopter pilot. Looks like a smart guy to me. <laughs> Go ahead. How fast do the helicopters need to go to get off the ground? Well, I think it redlined at, what, 130 knots? We flew at about 120. Uh, but to get off the ground? Oh, well, to get off the ground, well, you have, to, you have to hit, you know, the trick uh, is when you got a load, the trick is hitting, hitting uh, translational. And the way I used to do it with a heavy load was, and, and some of them would have to splice their way through a rice paddy just to get enough airspeed. These were, were, a lot of the time it was the gunships, which were overloaded, and some of the slicks too, just to hit translational so you get up in the air. But I found that if I dipped it to the right with right pedal, it took demand off the engine, gave me more power, and I could get translational sideways and then turn into the, to the flight. And so uh, taking off, you're just like the speed of walking. But then the first thing you want to do is get speed, and then you want to get altitude. You got that, young man? <laughs> I Go to helicopter ready. school. Yeah, I was going to say, put him in school. Yeah. He's ready. All right, go ahead, Karen. What I'd like to know, the Yui is the sexy bird out there, but the H-34 uh, is the workhorse. I'd like to know what a typical mission was for that airplane and uh, the type of things they had to do to accomplish those. And that's for the Sikorsky, yeah. you're asking. Typical mission for the Sikorsky. Okay. Who wants to... Uh, That'd be Ed. He did the missions. Okay. So Go ahead, Ed. Or, or Jesse. I'd say uh, Ed is uh, the one that can uh, explain this, but they pretty much used it for anything that they could put in it or put into the, into the field. Uh, since I've been here this week, I've told the story probably half a dozen times. I'd kind of uh, gotten rusty at telling the stories. Uh, we actually hauled a singing group, and I think they were the Ronettes. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful three girls, girls of color. They were gorgeous. They had beehive hairdos. They smelled pretty. I was in love. <laughs> And we took them into a zone with Huey gunships escort. We flew into a mountain outpost. The girls got out. We went back up and spun around for about 30 minutes and went back in and got them and, and brought them back somewhere and let them out. We didn't just hop them around. Uh, so I don't know if one of them had a brother on that outpost or something. I feel like there might have been something special going on here. But uh, it was... The aircraft, if you can only imagine, was used for everything conceivable in the world. And it was actually used for medevacs. Uh, it had no markings on it. Uh, we wasn't trying to hide from anybody or, or identify or anything. We, we might take a recon mission in and then automatically become a medevac. How about, how about a typical time for the mission how long do you think that thing what, what you know it, how to compare to a Huey another a couple hour mission is that probably about I right I don't think I could compare because I, I wasn't associated with Hueys uh, we just all just worked all day long uh, sun up to sundown 24 hours I believe the general said a while ago uh, it was 24 7 uh, the air wing saved my life the neat thing about it uh, that I never occurred to me when I joined was the air wing we did get to go home in most occasions back to a secure base, you know, and, and uh, have a hot meal and a clean, dry bed. Uh, medevac might come at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, so we had to go to the old club and drag the officers out of it and slap them around a little bit, you know, and help them in the cockpit. Uh, <laughs> the young guys. Got it. Yeah, I understand. The young guys. Yeah, yeah not us old guys. Yep. And... Uh, but uh, I wish we had the time to tell you about the ceremonial buffalo. Uh, no, we, don't, no. we do not that'll have be, time to tell later. that story, and it may not be appropriate. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, 
you just name whatever you could use a helicopter or a pickup truck for, or a Jeep or whatever, a pack mule. Ah, uh, so Jesse, how much fuel does that hold? It holds just shy of uh, 300 gallons. Okay. It's got a two hour range, just like the Huey does. We have a 30 minute uh, fuel light, but it feels like three minutes. So <laughs> we see the light come on, we land. Oh, so I understand. It's, uh, and it's doing about, uh, it's burning 65 to 70, economical, trying to just get it here and home and stuff like that. But in a hover, it's uh, with a load, it's burning 110 to 115 an hour. Okay, and you brought this thing from Oklahoma, right? Oklahoma. We're in the Tulsa oh. area. And, and, and how fast cruise speed-wise? Uh, we were coming up here. We had we got lucky with the wind gods. Uh, we had a tailwind, so we were doing about 100 uh, knots over the ground. Okay. We were indicating about 75 to 80, mm -hmm. and uh, it took us about uh, just shy of six hours to okay. get here, okay. and uh, uh, lots of gallons of gas. Okay. So. <laughs> I, I got to ask General Brady, what's the fastest you had a Yui? Fastest I've had it going. Yeah. We had. Uh, well, one of my guys uh, was uh, Hook, and you can read about him in the book. Uh, he he, uh, the aircraft was hit with a mortar, and by the time I got to him, he had a lot of head wounds, and I was really, really worried. And so I bent that damn thing over, and uh, it was right at the red line, which is what one thirty one. 123 is a published one. I'm sure it'll go faster than that. Well, the re and the ones we had, I think there was a red line there, and the aircraft started to shudder a little, and my co-pilot brought me back to my senses, and so I, I eased back. The beautiful thing about it was that there was one neurosurgeon in the country, and he was in our hospital that day. And so we got hooked into the hospital probably within 20 minutes like I say, you can read about the mission in my book. It was really a miraculous thing. And, and that surgeon opened up his head, and, uh, and to the day, he was a big, tall farm boy from Iowa, a great, great medic. And, uh, but he lived, and we played golf. He wasn't worth the shit on the golf course, but <laughs> he, had, he had two daughters, this Iowa farm guy. Now listen to this, and he's he's also in the Aviation Hall of Fame. Uh, he uh, one daughter is a Ph.D. from Duke, and the other has a master's degree from the University of Iowa. So this I don't know if he got out of the eighth grade or not, but uh, he was a he was a medic supreme. But anyhow, I got him on the bird, and I was really worried. And so I bent that damn thing over a lot more than I should have, and we might have had some mass bumping and so but anyhow we got him to the hospital but i think 130 knots is is about the fastest i ever went in that thing but when you're on the trees and you're going 120 knots that's fun but if one of those trees hits you it feels like a sledgehammer really even if it's a little small limb or something if it just hits you it's like a damn sledgehammer all right any other questions out there we got one right up front here sounds like I heard rumors I, I was reading somewhere that uh, there's one uh, rescue copter went in to save some people and uh, that there was no way to land and they actually used the rotor blades to chop their way into the jungle to make a pickup Is there any credence to that yeah that I've heard that I've heard that before but if the guy did that he was really stupid because uh, that, that, that blade will chop down some, and we, as I said, we had a bunch of very inexperienced young pilots, and we went through rotor blades like crazy. We were hitting trees all the time. But you don't chop your way into an area unless you're really dumb. Okay, with that, I'm going to wrap it up, but I've just been given the high sign that there's somebody else back behind you who, who wants to say something, so I guess I better... <coughs> Uh, pass it on to uh, Connie Boland here for a second. Uh, I suspect she's got a microphone, so Connie, you got it. Thank you. Uh, I'll say thank you to all these gentlemen, and it's, it's a pretty amazing uh, event here at Oshkosh where we can have all these uh, aircraft 
Uh, and uh, so thank you to all you guys. Thank you for General Brady uh, for being here. And uh, as soon as we get the, uh, the, the noise down here just a little bit, I'd, I'd like to take just a moment. Ed may have already mentioned our thanks to American Airlines, but it is a very special thing that they do for the veterans. So General Brady is here today, courtesy of American Airlines. Uh, they provided the transportation for him. They also have the honor flight in progress to DC tonight. Uh, they will be returning here to Oshkosh after their day in Washington, D.C. They have uh, an airplane that they have dedicated to the Medal of Honor recipients. So I just wanted to give a shout out to American Airlines and say uh, thank you very much for uh, your support of our veterans. So that's back All right. to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Connie. And I'll thank just you. say. Thank you, guys. You, you look up the definition of, of hero in, well, I'd say the, the, the dictionary, but now I guess I've got to say the Internet. And the first word is courage. The second is significant achievements. And the third is nobility. And we've got that man in our presence today. So oh, thank, thank you, you General Brady. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. God bless you. You bet. Pleasure being Thanks, with Dave. you guys. Appreciate it. Good job. Mike, appreciate it.